Hi, and welcome to Edwards Laboratory Talk podcast. I am Dan Rutherford, and I've worked with uh, in multiple roles during my 24 years at Edwards. I'm currently the market sector manager for analytical OEMs. Hi, and I'm David Steele, and I'm the market sector manager for R&D, and I've been involved in the vacuum technology industry for about 35 years, just over 25 years of that at Edwards. So today, Dave and I are going to talk to you about primary pumps. Uh, just going to have a general discussion here about the the pumps, the features, the benefits, uh, things that everybody wants to think about when they're starting off looking at buying a power, uh, primary pump. So, Dave, what would you describe as a primary pump? Well, that's a good question, Dan. It, it does get asked quite a lot, you know, what is a primary pump? And the way I would define it, and I think it's probably what most people would do too, is that it's a vacuum pump that's capable of pumping a vacuum system or operating from atmospheric pressure down and exhausting that gas directly to atmospheric pressure. So it's a pump that will typically go down into the millitor or 10 to the minus three millibar range right. and exhaust directly to atmospheric pressure. Right. And the types of ba uh, backing pump used determines that ultimate pressure you reach. So I, you pretty much the same description here. So do it by the pressure regime of operations to pump this designed to exhaust atmospheric pressure. And of course, we see these used, you know, typically to back second, you know, to back what we call a secondary pump, like a turbo or a diffusion pump, mm -hmm. um, which you'll find a lot in mass spectrometry. So these primary pumps are used on a lot of mass specs, some microscopy, uh, freeze drying, gel drying, um, tons of other applications, even just simple laboratory experiments, um, even uh, air conditioning, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, it's almost an endless list of applications yeah. that yeah. primary pumps get used for. I guess the term rough pump is another way to describe yeah. these, or, and that's a very common way that they get described. Yeah, I, get, I, I hear them called roughing pumps or four pumps. And of course, if they're used with a secondary pump, they'll be called backing pump. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess it all depends on what your application is and what you might refer to it as. Yeah. So, yep. So, yeah, in, they, in, sorry, Dan, I'm talking over you. They're, they're, they really are sort of general purpose pumps that get used for loads and loads and loads of applications. They're kind of, they're the workhorse of the vacuum industry. You, you have to have one of these to get going before you do anything else. Sometimes they're a pump you just use in their own right. And sometimes, like you mentioned, they're a secondary pump. Uh, used before you move to something capable of a, a lower pressure. Great. So, so when we're when people are looking at getting a backing pump, uh, you know, they ask us where do we start at. So a lot of time it's it's down to people think of pump size. You know, what size pump do I need to run this? Now, since we're talking laboratory use, these are typically single phase air cooled pumps. Most labs don't have that application. You know, that that type of space. And and uh, not this pardon me space, but resources to to run a three phase water cooled pump. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we're looking at pump size. You know, when, when we talk about pump size, we're talking about I need a chamber of X size to get down to this pressure at, in a certain period of time, or it could be I have this much flow and I need to have a pressure of X, or my turbo needs a critical back pressure of Y. Mm. Um, anything else that you can think of they consider? Well, I think probably my favorite question that. Uh, I get asked when someone's trying to pick a pump is, hey, what what's the best pump for me to use? Mm -hmm. And uh, really, that is a, that's a how long is a piece of string um, question. <laughs> it really does fit around the, the the kind of things you described, what the facilities mm -hmm. are that you've got available, um, what your budget is, um, yep. and what the sort of the flexibility is of what you're trying to do. Um, sometimes a primary pump's just used for rough pumping something down to a certain pressure. Mm -hmm. Does that need to be done repeatedly? Does it need to be done in a specific amount of time? You know, does it mm -hmm. have to be under, uh, I'll pull a number out the air, does it have to be done in under 30 seconds? What happens if it's 35 seconds? What about if it's a minute or an hour? Is the flexibility in that, I guess the primary thing that that will impact is how much the pumping system will cost. Um, a bit like a you know a sports car, the right. higher performance you need, the more it's going to cost, and uh, at some point you end up throwing more financial resource into it than you than you really need to spend. So we uh, see that a lot. We do, we do we see do. that a lot. Yeah, and, and, and I, of course, do... the... go ahead, David. I'm I'm stepping on you now. Oh, that's okay. Uh, and I 
generally try and think of, you know, when spending money on a vacuum pump as if it's my money uh, and try and guide somebody in, in that kind of direction. Um, you know, f- the financial resource is a finite one for sure, mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately for most of us. Um, and so making that as you know, sort of starting in that position is, is usually a good place to start. And like you mentioned, you know, the, the, the application does take hold here. What are you actually trying to pump? You know, is it just like I said, roughing down a chamber, which you're just pull, you know pumping air? Um, are you you know what what application are you doing under vacuum? Uh, does the sample that you have in this chamber is this, is it uh, susceptible to be damaged by, say, backstring of oil from a, a oil a, you know what we call a wet or a oil sealed pump? Mm-hmm. So those all go into it. But of course, and the cost factors because because we'll go into the next part here. We're looking at you know when you're selecting a pump, do you want to try a wet pump or a dry pump? Right. Uh, everybody thinks that dry pumps are the be all end all, but as you mentioned, cost is a huge driver here. And if, if the if you don't need a dry pump, you know the cost and you have a limited cost budget. Your wet pump might might be the way to go, but of course, even there, you're not looking at just a simple answer. Just besides, you know, because you have to again look at all the application stuff. Mm. So, so with wet pumps, okay, let's let's look at the different types of oil sealed rotary vane pumps, or again, what we call wet pumps. You know, you see in the laboratory market, you don't see too many large, you don't see too many screw pumps or piston pumps. The most popular ones are the rotary vein pumps. And again, we have pumps that are uh, lower cost compared to other rotary vein pumps. So let's say a single stage rotary vein pump compared to a dual stage. Um, you want to talk to the people about what the benefit is of a single stage over a dual stage? Sure. I mean, the, the main decision making point for, for a single stage or a two stage rotary vein pump is chiefly is the pressure regime that the pump is going to be operating in um, and traded off with the ultimate pressure that you need or would like to achieve with the system. Um, A two-stage, the the pumps both work using the same principle, which is a a sliding vein inside uh, an annulus that that slides the uh, gap of air that's or gas that's captured within the pump and compresses it to a smaller volume with a two-stage pump you simply have two in series and the mechanism is capable of a much lower pressure the general rule that i use dan is to say if your application is going to stay above about a tenth of an atmosphere 100 millibar or so mm-hmm more or less continuously, then absolutely a single stage pumps the right one to choose. And indeed, if it's going to be in that pressure regime continuously, that is the right technology to choose. Because if right. you use a two stage pump, you're actually going to end up damaging it or at least shortening its life dramatically because um, you'll end up oil starving part of the mechanism. Right. Uh, Unless you've yeah. got a dual stage pump like an RV, a, sorry, a dual mode pump um, like the RV pump. Exactly, because in a, in, a, in a high flow situation, like you said, above 100 millibar, you tend to starve the second stage of oil. So exactly with our with our rotary vein pumps, the RV series pumps that Edwards carries, we actually have a high flow mode selector on it, which ports that high pressure oil to the second stage to keep it to keep it lubricated so you do not damage that stage during high vac- high pressure operations. Well, what we will call higher pressure operations, of course, it's all relative. Mm-hmm. So so that's a good point. That's uh, that's one nice thing about the RV series. It, it is set up so that if it happens to be the only pump you have and you need to do both ki- kinds of situations, uh, you know, a better ultimate or a higher flow, then you can do that with one pump by a single operation of a, of a knob. So that's always great. So now, as you mentioned, you know, with with the oil seal pump, basically what you're getting is the oil does that function. It seals the gap between the rotor and the stator, mm-hmm. and it allows you to compress that gas out to atmospheric pressure. Uh, it also, of course, carries a lot of the heat away from that, reduces the friction at that point, um, minimizes the wear and tear of the the rotor and the stator components themselves. Um, and but there are some things that can impact the the oil quality that you have and therefore reduce the pump life aren't there there's a lot of different factors 
All right, and probably the biggest one that we run into, or the most common one, I should say, is our condensable vapors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, if you're pumping a vacuum system down that's been open to atmospheric air, it's got a lot of water vapor in it. Mm -hmm. um, and keeping, with all of these pumps, it's a, generally speaking, keeping gases or vapors in their gaseous phase is the key thing to both uh, good operation and reliable and long-term operation while minimizing uh, maintenance. So right. keeping that gas in vapor phase is key to performance. Um, there's, I guess there's a little bit of uh, emotion and I know certainly I've been guilty of, 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 of this decision um, in the past and that's choosing not to use gas ballast because right. when you turn on the gas ballast knob, if you've got a pressure gauge, a vacuum gauge on your on your pump, you'll see the pressure will go up by about a decade. And we, I think we're all probably guilty of putting mm -hmm. a lot of worth or a lot of value on what the ultimate pressure is of the pump, even if that's an irrelevant um, specification for what you're exactly. actually doing. Exactly. There, there are a lot of applications where you're using this pump and you don't need that deep of an ultimate and you could use the gas ballast which will again keep that oil clean, keep the you know keep the lubrication properties up, and keep the solvents or or water vapor out of out of that oil. Mm -hmm. um, so it is it is important to understand what pressure you really need to be operating at. Can you then go to say a gas ballast? We have a couple different settings on our our rotary vane pumps. You can go to a gas ballast one or a gas ballast two position, and you could have a healthier pump. But when you talk about gas ballasting too, even if you do need, so let's say it's a uh, a freeze drying application where they want the best ultimate possible. Um, if, even if you need that, be, you know, that better ultimate, you can always use gas ballast before and after your application is running to keep that oil stream. You know, so basically start at the pump ahead of time, put on the gas ballast, run it, let it run for 30 to 60 minutes, clean up that oil, then do your process. And then before you shut the pump down, run that gas ballast again. Mm -hmm. so, and it's, it's it's probably also worth always remembering that whenever you've got like your freeze drying application, if you've got a lot of saturated vapor around, mm -hmm. it's actually that that's going to be dominating or limiting the ultimate pressure that mm -hmm. the pump's capable of, of at that time. So turning on the gas ballast is never going to hurt anything. And in 99% of the cases, it's going to help things by basically by speeding things up and making sure that that vapor doesn't condense within the pump because once you've condensed vapor back into a liquid inside the pump itself it takes a lot more energy and that right. convert, that directly translates to more time to re-vaporize you know phase shift it back to a vapor and then pump it out again so exactly. keeping it in vapor phase is always the best uh the, the best choice of action uh, if you can Exactly. So gas ballast your friend, I guess, is the way is I your friend. it. Yep. And in fact, you can go to our website and you can see a whole article. We have a there's a white paper up there, uh, or we can send it to you upon request. Uh, a whole guide to gas ballasting of, of oil sealed pumps, and it's well worth the read. Mm -hmm. So please let us know if you need something like that. Um, but we can look at some pros and cons of 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 our oil sealed pumps here. So I would say as as far as a wet versus dry part for a pro on the on the oil seal pumps. Uh, of course, typically you see deeper ultimates with a, with a especially a two stage uh, rotary vane pump. So mm -hmm. that could be that could be a, a slight benefit. Even though these days the scrolls and the 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 other dry pumps are are reaching easily into the minus three pressure range. Um, they are lower cost. Um, they are easy to maintain, and I think that's the beauty of it, especially in applicant and and. There are a lot of places, a lot of universities, especially, where uh, ease of maintenance is is a is a priority because it keeps their cost down. Mm -hmm. So there's full there. You know, we we as Edwards, we sell full uh, servicing kits for these pumps that are if if you have a good amount of mechanical ability, you could easily service this pump. Um, but on the negative side to this, so we we talk about the oil first of all. And I think oil altogether, we may have a whole new podcast on oil just to talk about the different kinds of oil and what their benefits are but would you agree i think david that the the one of the worst things that people well besides leaks uh backstreaming of oil is one of the biggest cons 
for this? I'd say it's more a case of concern about backstreaming mm -hmm. rather than actual backstreaming itself. Right. Um, it, it's a bit like um, being – here's an imperfect analogy, Dan, uh, um, while I go off on a slight tangent. Um, uh, and all, we're all worried about sharks while swimming in the ocean, <laughs> but the actual risk of getting hurt by a shark is almost nothing. Um, backstreaming – if a pump's improperly operated uh, yes. and bad practice is used, then yes, backstreaming of an mm -hmm. oil seal pump could be a potential source of contamination to your vacuum system. Equally so, a badly run dry pump can give you, you know, maybe not yes. exactly the same problems, but equivalent ones. So it's not like you're eliminating right. it. Good vacuum practice uh, almost always covers for these things, um, you know, beyond just things that are beyond everyone's control or, or, or imagination even. Right. And we do have ways also, if, if you happen to have a, a big concern about backstreaming, just a simple use of what we call a FL20K, a, a, mm, a four-line trap. Four mm -hmm. trap. It's got an activated alumina in there. And with proper maintenance, um, even, in the, even in conditions where you have folks operating these primary pumps that are not used to it and have bad practices, uh, that can really reduce the concern for backstreaming a lot. Um, I also see one of the one of the I think is a con of a wet pump over a dry pump is with a with a wet pump. If I'm doing a lot of flow through the system, I tend to you know exhaust eject a lot of ex oil out the exhaust of the pump. Mm -hmm. But uh, but again, because it 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 entrains that oil mist with it and it carries it out in heavy quantities, and it's something you need to be aware of. Um, you need to be monitoring that situation if you don't have the proper accessories on the exhaust of the system. Um, in our case, what I recommend by that for accessories is our EMF, which is our mist filter. We sell them in appropriate sizes for, for all of our oil sealed pumps. And also our oil return kits, which will take the oil uh, from the mist filter. That's it basically, it captures what happens is when the exhaust leaves the pump uh, and goes through a mist filter, the, the gaskets can take the bends to go through the filtering elements, but the oil cannot. So it forms the droplets and drops into the bottom of the mist filter container. And mm -hmm. then the oil return kit, kit will use a slight uh, draw of uh, gas from the from the gas ballast to draw the oil back into the oil box. So it helps you maintain the level of oil. So there are some, you know, what we see negatives, but there's always ways to work around it. So... Um, are there any other accessories you can think of here that I'm missing, Dave, off the top of my head? Well, I think before we pass on from mist filters, my the list of Dave's advice for vacuum equipment is I, I think every oil seal rotary vein pump should always have. Always. Uh, this is this is my broken record uh, speech here on uh, mist filters. Every oil seal rotary vein pump should have a mist filter on it, regardless yes. of where it's exhausting into. Um, it, 100% if it's going into the room that you're sitting in, stick a mist filter on there. Even if you're putting it into the, into some extracted duct work, if, and you say, oh, well, I don't need one, uh, the oil mist will go into the duct work. You're passing that problem onto the people that have to maintain the duct work. Exactly. Yeah. At best, it's messy, and at worst, it could be hazardous. So right. always, always, always fit a mist filter. Um, and make sure I, I you update like, the mist filter as well. The odor, there are odor elements and there's oil elements there, so you need to make sure that you you maintain that mist filter to yeah. keep it functioning 100%. Because if you get into a lab that has uh, an oil pump that's exhausting in the atmosphere that's running 24/7, that that mist filter is a godsend. That's yeah, it all it is. Really is. It really is. You, you literally just took the words out of my mouth. I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah, it's any, ex, well, any, most accessories that you add on to a vacuum pump, there's going to be some maintenance involved. We talked about mm -hmm. four line traps a minute ago. Mm -hmm. You know, a saturated four line trap is no better, probably worse than no four line trap. Right. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the fortunate thing with um, our EMF filters is they have an overpressure device in them so that if the mist filter does become completely blocked. You know, if you don't do the maintenance and swap the filters out, um, they will lift up and to allow the, the gas to bypass them to, you know, so you don't overpressure the pump itself. Right. So if you start to see oil mist on uh, an EMF mist filter, Edwards EMF mist filter, that's it's telling you that you haven't been maintaining your mist filter and that it's time to swap them. And if you keep up with that, and especially the odor element that you mentioned, it takes the oily smell out that's sometimes associated with that. Um, mm -hmm. If you're cycling a system up and down fairly frequently where you're, a lot of gas is going through it and into the room, 
yeah, it's an important accessory to uh, or maintenance uh, thing to keep up on. Um, yeah. What else? Here? So um, we talk. You talked briefly about oil return kit. Our bas gas ballast oil return kit. That's one of my favourite accessories for for applications where you need gas ballast because the mist filter is going to trap the you know aerosolized. Um, mist. Sometimes people call it, erroneously call it smoke. It's 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 aerosolized it's oil. It's mist. Yep. Um, once the mist filter's done its job and you know recoalesced or coalesced it back into a liquid and it's sitting in the bottom bottom of the uh, the mist filter itself, you've got to get that back into the pump and the gas ballast oil return accessory GBOR um, mm -hmm. does that continuously and automatically so you don't have to fit it if you've got an application where you need to run gas ballast i love that accessory yeah. it's really smart you gotta, you gotta make sure you pick the right one though because we have two gas ballast for oil return kits where mm -hmm. we actually have the clean kit which mm -hmm. is basically it goes in it's a it's a standard set it's just a little knob that gets put in the gas ballast and it has a constant draw for the oil to go back and then as yep. you mentioned we have our gas ballast oil return kit in which case like you said if you need to run gas ballast it does have a way that you can actually make a setting of gas ballast one or two on that accessory so that you get the double effect. Not only do you return the oil, but again, you maintain the gas ballast flow for your, to keep your pump oil clean. So that's, that's great. That's great information. Again, you, it, when you, when you team up a, a good quality primary, uh, your primary pump with a, with these accessories, you can get, you know, very good operation out of them. You can, you can keep things pretty clean. Yeah, so, and I, I so, think I'd probably be remiss with my other accessory, and I'm gonna I'm off on another tangent, Dan. Okay. A vacuum gauge with with any of these yeah. systems, whatever the pump is, if you're not measuring the pressure properly, you don't know what's going on. It's this. It's such a handy yeah. troubleshooting tool. Gauging's key. I I, I, prom I, I promise I not to say this any more number one thing. No, I I agree a hundred percent, David. I can't tell you how many times I get a phone call from somebody, yeah. and they think their primary pump's not working properly. And I asked him, have you put a gauge on the pump to see how it's running? You know, I mean, just a simple Pirani gauge being around will, will, will allow you to do that and to make sure that, you're, that that pump is acting as it would because you may have a leak somewhere that you just don't know about. Mm -hmm. Or it could be you're not expecting the right amount of, you know, you, you don't know how much flow you have going through the system and what your pressure is going to be. So a, a good quality gauge like our Pirani gauge, the new APG 200 is, is a very wise investment for yeah. any of these so um moving on to primary pumps so now let's let's open up the pandora box here called dry pumps mm -hmm. okay um i know we're running a bit long here so we will go through we'll keep the surface level on this on this um but dry pumps of course they you know the one thing that we said about primary uh, with wet pumps is they do tend to be lower cost dryer pumps tend to be higher cost people always ask me why that is now the basic way I put it to them is I say, hey, look, with with any errors in machining, and I wouldn't say errors in machining, but any anything over time that you have between a rotor and a stator of an oil sealed pump, the oil is going to seal it. Period. Um, the tolerances don't have to be that tight. The materials are very different. With a dry pump, especially a scroll or a multi-stage roots pump, the the uh, tolerances on the machining is very tight. The, uh, the the clearances are very important. So it's it's a whole new animal. So it does take more in the cost of materials and machining time. And you need some really high skill level on a multi-stage roots to to install to put it together. Yeah. So so looking at the dry pumps. So first we have diaphragm pumps. Okay, that's uh, that's kind of what I would refer as entry level to a, a dry market, wouldn't you think? Uh we might be being a bit unfair. I think you know they're certainly more sophisticated than a goldfish bowl pump. Uh, yeah, but yes, they're true. Certainly, they're really good. They've got a really nice niche for applications where you only need mm -hmm. a sort of a fairly rough vacuum down to about you know one hundredth ish of an atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the ten, a hundred ten five tor ish levels. Um, I think the best I've seen is about one or two millibar ultimate is the best I've seen on a diaphragm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And uh, they are they're great little mechanisms for for applications um, that that need um, a simple sealed mechanism. They kind of come in two flavors: clean duty ones, mm -hmm. and those tend to be optimized around 
as low a pressure as possible and they tend to have a bit of a niche uh certainly with with us anyway of backing small turbo pumps so they make right. really really um these days quite good backing pumps for small turbos on small systems that don't need to be cycled very much the reason why i say that is that they haven't got a lot of pumping speed compared to their larger dry or wet cousins and mm -hmm. the pumping speed sort of linearly drops from atmospheric pressure so if you've got a larger system it can take a long time to run a long time yeah because they, they have almost no pumping speed at the pressure that the that a turbo needs to exhaust at and so it takes a long time to get there whereas um, pumps like scroll pumps and multi-stage roots pumps like nxr pumps have loads of pumping speed at that pressure and can get there um the, the so, other type are chemical pumps chemical right. chemical duty pumps and that's where i see tell you the truth that's where i see a lot of benefit of the diaphragm pump i mean it's easy to make a well it's easier to make a diaphragm pump that has uh say a teflon or a chemraz type diaphragm with there and to maintain it uh, so we do see a lot of diaphragm pumps in that market um in the in the laboratory or laboratory as my british friend says uh market i tend to see uh the benefit of some of these diaphragm pumps is you can get some very small ones for backing turbos um in the harsh environment market the, the portable mass spectrometry market uh, likes to use these in conjunction with small turbos because they are very low power you can hook them up to a battery and run them quite easily mm -hmm. for a while so they are like i said i, I you're right over a over a fish bowl or a, a food saver pump they are you know a much higher level but uh, in the in the laboratory i think that's a kind of an entry level then we kind of move on to the scroll pumps now we have our NXDS and our XDS score pump range. So we we range in size from about, um, well, soon here, we'll have down to about three cubic meters per hour, all the way up to 46 cubic meters per hour in a, in a single phase air-cooled scroll pump. Mm -hmm. um, and with our pumps, the, the beauty of the Edwards uh, NXDS and XDS pumps, uh, besides the fact that they're very quiet, they're very low power, um, they're also very easy to maintain. Um, so you're not looking at, uh, with the NXDS, sometimes I see two to four years of tip seal life, depending upon the application. So, so you get a lot of benefit there with service. Um, and they, uh, and if you look at the green considerations with dry, with dry pumps in general, um, we can get a lot lower power levels and a lot less energy released into your lab with these pumps, um, than we can with a wet pump of the same size typically. Yeah, it's some. It's difficult to make gen generalizations, mm -hmm. but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway, um, <laughs> because because you're not sloshing oil around inside the mm -hmm. pumping mechanism. You're not. I'm. I'm going to use the term wasting energy. You're not using mm -hmm. energy moving oil around, and so generally speaking, uh, an equivalent size dry pump to a wet pump will be about. 20% less power in that kind of region. Um, and that's, you know, it's essentially because you're not moving oil around. Um, so yeah, it's it's a def for, for sure a, a, um, a greener choice. Uh, added to that is the um, not needing to do routine oil um, changes, right. which we kind of glossed over when we talked about wet pumps earlier. Right. Uh, but that's, I mean, it's, I would call it more of an inconvenience than a major environmental concern. But if you've got a lab where you've got lots of pumps, you know, it's not uncommon to walk into a lab and see they've got, you know, not one or two pumps, but 10 or 20 or, mm -hmm. or more. Um, as particularly if they're being used in applications where the oil needs to be changed actually quite root more, more routinely than say a minimum, which we'd, we'd probably say, what would you say? Three months, I think is what our uh, yeah. manuals Min tend to say. Yeah. Um, it could be you're running an application where you have to change the oil weekly. In that case, that's a lot of oil to go through. So maybe moving to a dry pump is a good choice. I've seen, as you know, I deal with the mass spectrometry market a lot. And these days on the newer LCMS systems, the smallest backing pump that you get is about 40 cubic meters per hour. Mm -hmm. And then you see systems with the 60 size pumps. Uh, then you see pumps, you see systems that you'll you'll start to see a lot of these systems come out that are 100 cubic meters per hour plus on the front end of these instruments, and a lot of those will go dry because that's where the benefit really comes in. The multi with the multi-stage roots pump like our NXR pumps 
that we have. We have a pumping speed of 30 cubic meter per hour all the way up to 120 cubic per hour. This multi-stage root pump is a very small package. It's, uh, in fact, I had one running on my island down in my kitchen uh, during COVID to make a little video of it, and it was about the size of my toaster oven. That's how small the 120 cubic meter per hour pump is, and it will pull about 450 watts at its ultimate pressure. Compared to a, an oil pump of that size, if you can find a single one, there are some out there that will go up to 120 cubic meters per hour that are single phase, but mm -hmm. they'll probably be drawing over a kilowatt of power doing that. Um, but then there's also, as you said, there's the oil changes and everything else on this. With the multi-stage roots pump like the NXR, you're looking at a five-year service interval. So you plug it in, you run it 24-7 for five years straight, and, and then you basically exchange the pump and have it sent back because that's not a pump you can really service in the field. So mm. there are the, the, the green benefits because we got to think not just the power that the pump draws and uses, you know, that you're going to pay your electric bill on there. But then most of that heat, like you said, that goes it's it's goes into the the lab as heat, you know. It, so you it really is it, quite remarkable, isn't it? You know, moving yeah. to a pump technology mm -hmm. that can run for five years with no maintenance. It's it's right. close to unbelievable. It's like, how on earth could you possibly do that? But it's it's basically by taking out the things or not using the things that require maintenance. It really yep. is quite impressive. And we've done systems before where we've taken two uh, 60 cubic meter per hour wet pumps and replaced them with a single dry pump. Mm -hmm. And then your cost of ownership comes back into play. You know, I'm not buying two wet pumps and the hardware didn't connect them and putting all that power. Now you're talking about probably close to a kilowatt and a half for two pumps. Because yeah. again, you're sloshing all that oil around. I'm now going to a single pump. It's nice and clean. It's on the floor. And as you see with some of these labs, they have 20, 30 instruments in a single room. And um, when you cut the number of pumps in half and you go from a wet to a dry, the, the noise is, level is also much different between a wet and a dry pump. You'll find that our, these dry pumps are typically around the 54, 55 dBA range where the wet pumps could be in the 60s. And you put enough of these in a room it gets to be overbearing, especially yeah. running 24-7. Yeah, less so. heat load directly translates with an air-cooled pump to less air that you need to blow over it. So, And it's the fan in the end with these that ends up being just about the noisiest thing. Like right. your, your computer, you know, the, the, the computers get quite loud if they're having to work hard, and it's the fan that's that's caused the noise. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I think we've kind of gone over our time a lot in here. We get chatting like this. But we'll we'll definitely go into more of these pumps, uh, you know, each different version. Maybe we'll do a, a podcast just on scroll pumps and, and rotary vein pumps and multi-stage roots later on. Um, I think our next uh, our next episode is going to be actually be on secondary pumps. So we'll start talking about diffusion pumps and turbo. Um, anything else you want to add before we jump off here, Dave? No, I think that's it. My my only reminder for, for folks using oil seal pumps, in fact, dry pumps too, is that gas ballast is gas your friend. Ballast. That's my, my little mantra. That's right, because uh, water vapor is not too friendly to some of these uh, these uh, carbon steel rotors that we're losing in dry pumps these days. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep them clean. You want the ultimate to be as, be as good as you can. Gas ballast is your friend. So, well, if you have any immediate need for more information on this subject, please reach out to David or myself or any of the technical folks at Edwards Vacuum by emailing info at edwardsvacuum.com. Until next time, this has been Dan and Dave from Edwards Vacuum uh, Laboratory Talk. Have a good day.